Hello again, uh, everybody. Uh, this is a continuation of Chapter 12, which deals with uh, renewable energy from solar and wind and hydropower. And this is Part 3 on hydropower. Now, <clears throat> hydropower is a well, what I call a mature technology. There's not really uh, much research going on in uh, <laughs> the field of hydropower. It's been used in one way or another since the 16th century. Uh, you know, they've used water wheels to grind grain, pump water, and for, uh, you know, in industrial purposes. Eventually, you know, in the late 1800s, it was replaced by the steam engine, uh, but uh, hydropower has been used uh, for many purposes for a long time. Nowadays, of course, it's almost exclusively used for electricity generation. Sometimes the dams... Uh, are put in place for sort of dual purposes to generate electricity, but also for flood control and uh, irrigation purposes. As we learned, I think it was in chapter one, Canada is endowed with enormous uh, hydropower resources, mostly in Quebec. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's Canada ranks third in the world after China and Brazil on hydropower, the sheer amount of of hydropower production. And in terms of uh, the percentage of electricity from hydropower, Canada gets 64% of our electricity from uh, hydropower. Uh, worldwide, that's more like around 21%. So we have a lot of hydropower compared to the world. There are little uh, countries like Norway that get almost all of their electricity, as does Quebec. And uh, Nepal gets all, almost all of their electricity from hydropower. I've got this graphic down here. This is from the Canadian Hydropower Association. Uh, the green tries to show how much uh, generation there could be. And what we're interested, really interested in is the blue, which is the currently installed capacity. Now, I'll point out that this is a, a terrible graphic. Uh, I just couldn't find a better one. Like, if you look at the size of this blue bar, which is 38,400 uh, megawatts of uh, uh, hydroelectricity production in Quebec. <laughs> and then you look at the size of this bar, which is 400. Uh, the bar sizes don't make any sense. Anyway, so just look at the numbers. If you look at the numbers, you can see that the big producer in Canada is Quebec. That's because of the James Bay project. They get almost all, 96% of electricity generation in Quebec is from hydropower. And electricity is so cheap that they even use it to uh, heat their homes. So there's uh, uh, not a lot of gas furnaces in Quebec for that reason. Other big uh, producers in Canada would be, uh, well, we've got Ontario. BC has a lot of uh, hydropower from uh, from dams, and uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, and some in Manitoba, and the others are all uh, fairly small producers. So Canada has significant hydropower resources, and that kind of gives us a big advantage in terms of decarbonizing our uh, electricity uh, for things like transportation. And as we talked about earlier in the course, we could use this low-carbon electricity for home heating, either as Quebec does through baseboard heaters, you know, where you have a coefficient of performance of one, or you could use it uh, in a heat pump and get a much higher uh, coefficient of performance. So, yeah, Canada has lots of hydropower. We're third after China and Brazil. And then it's the United States, Venezuela, got this from the World Energy Council, and these are amounts of energy in this weird unit, MTOE, M or MTO, millions of tons of oil equivalent. doesn't really matter. Uh, the key is that we, we have a lot of hydro production. We're sort of blessed with that in terms of uh, keeping the carbon emissions down for our electricity. We don't really need to use coal. And of course, hydropower is renewable. It is renewed by the, the water cycle or the hydrological cycle. Uh, water power is a consequence of uh, uh, gravitational potential energy being acquired by water that evaporates and 
rains at higher altitude. And so uh, ultimately that gravitational potential energy is powered by sunlight, of course. So fundamentally hydropower is solar energy that gives rise to uh, gravitational potential energy, uh, you know, raising water to a height. Remember, gravitational potential energy is the energy associated with an object's height in a gravitational field. I thought I'd give a Canadian flavor to this presentation. I've been trying to do that. You should know, you should be aware of, in Quebec, on the eastern side of James Bay, right here's Hudson's Bay and here's James Bay. So right here is a huge hydropower installation called the James Bay Project, which started in the 1970s and has been extended, uh, well, it's been being built for decades. It has a series of dams with uh, 16,000 megawatts electrical. So remember how a, a, coal fire, a big coal fire plant might be 1,000 megawatts electrical. So that's like 16 big coal fire plants for the small province of Quebec. So they have an abundance of... Uh, uh, of hydropower and hydropower unlike other renewables has a very high capacity factor it can run uh, i mean there's some seasonal component associated with spring runoff but it would typically have capacity factors near 100 percent, and there'd be no intermittency so what quebec did is they uh, dammed and diverted some rivers the la grande river is one of them and this picture up here is, you can see the, the cutout, the huge cutout that was done. This is the spillway. This is the water that comes out of the turbine at the La Grande Dam. I think it's in the well, La Grande River. I think the dam is called the Robert Barassa Dam after one of their premiers uh, from the 1970s, I think. Uh, as you can imagine, this sort of uh, huge damming of rivers and diversion of, uh, of uh, rivers and, and flooding of lands. They flooded 11,000 square kilometers of wilderness land that used to be the, uh, you know, the trapping land and homes of the James Bay Cree and uh, some Inuit. They'd been, uh, you know, uh, these First Nations people have been trapping on this land for, uh, you know, thousands of years, maybe 10,000 years or so, and uh, it's been flooded. Of course, that resulted in uh, conflicts and protests uh, and uh, when traditional lands were exposed from First Nations, people were expropriated and there has been uh, uh, financial compensation for that. But as you know from the recent protests that uh, financial compensation, compensation doesn't always uh, resolve all these issues. So if you look back at the chart on the previous slide, you'll see that Quebec produces enormous amounts of hydropower. It's the main reason that Hydropower supplies 96% of Quebec's electricity. That's the James Bay Project. Uh, you, should, you should be aware of that. Okay, so fundamentally, how does a hydropower installation work? Well, uh, you're converting the gravitational potential energy of water, so the energy that the water has because it's at a high elevation, and you're running it uh, downhill through a turbine and converting it to electricity. So that's the energy transformation. In engineering, uh, head is the word used for the height of water. I don't know why, but it's just traditionally we refer to a high head dam would be a dam that has a high uh, reservoir behind it. And so this elevation here is called head. The water runs through a pipe called the penstock, turns a turbine. I'm going to show you some different types of turbine. And then it runs out here into the spillway. And you saw the big spillway, the cutout in the uh, uh, Robert Barassa Dam in the previous slide. And so this is from a figure from your book showing the simplified model of a high head hydropower uh, plant. Head refers to the, the height here, water. Uh, so we're converting... Uh, gravitational potential energy into electricity and modern dams, modern hydraulic turbines, water turbines are really efficient. You can get a 80, at least 85% is a typical efficiency. So you get really good conversion of gravitational potential energy uh, directly to electricity. 
Oh, and I showed a picture up here in, in Ontario. We have the uh, Sir Adam Beck uh, Falls. It wouldn't be considered, it'd be considered a moderate head. This height is not really high, um, but you can see the reservoir back here. That's in Niagara Falls, Ontario. So there's different kinds of turbines. Uh, one is called a Kaplan turbine. I've got a picture down here. It looks like a big propeller. Water flows through, turns the propeller. And these propeller blades are made so that you can adjust the pitch so that the water comes onto the blades just right to get good efficiency. This kind of turbine is used when you don't have a lot of height, when the distance that the water's falling through the turbine is relatively low. So it's used when you have a low head, but a relatively high flow rate. Uh, and the adjustable pitch blades improve the efficiency. I mentioned that. So that's a Kaplan turbine. Looks like a motorboat propeller. When you have a bit more head, a bit more height, you can use what's called a Francis turbine. This is the impeller of a Francis turbine. Water comes in and comes in around the periphery, spins this turbine, and it, the water goes down out the center. So here's a Francis turbine impeller, but it's been flipped upside down, so you can see that's the, actually the bottom there. So water comes in uh, uh, tangentially here onto these blades, and these blades are a bit shaped like airfoils, so you get a bit of lift, and it spins this uh, uh, impeller, and water falls out uh, through the bottom. As I mentioned, this is turned upside down. The Sir Adam Beck uh, hydroelectric dam in Niagara Falls uh, uses Francis turbines. And then the, uh, the even more extreme, if you have a really high uh, head, so if you have, a, if you have a, uh, maybe a, wa a high waterfall and you have a lot of elevation but not much flow rate, you can use what's called a pelton wheel turbine and it puts the water through a nozzle, accelerates it, and it hits these little buckets and that turns the water around. Here's an impeller of a, of a uh, uh, pelton wheel turbine. And so that's used when you have a, high head, so lots of elevation between the, the outflow and the reservoir, but not much flow rate, uh, then you would use this kind of, this kind of turbine. So that's, there's other kinds of uh, uh, power turbines as well, but those are the three main types. You can see one here uh, with the cover off. So a little bit of the physics and a, a simple calculation. So uh, the power output of a hydraulic turbine depends upon the, the head, the height. You know, here's the reservoir flowing down through the penstock to the turbine and the outflow. This, he this height here, so the higher that head is, the more energy you're going to extract, the more gravitational potential energy. It also depends upon the mass flow rate of water, how many kilograms per second are uh, uh, going down through the uh, penstock. Lost my, lost my mouse for a second here. My computer's locked up. So it depends on the mass flow rate through this pipe. So we learned in chapter two that the change in potential energy, this gravitational poten potential energy, if you remember chapter two, it's mg, that's the weight of the object times the height. That's mgh is gravitational potential energy in joules. And what the power output depends upon is the rate at which the water's losing gravitational potential energy per unit time. Remember, power is energy per unit time. So the power output from the turbine, maximum, not including the efficiency of the turbine, is the change in the potential energy per unit time. So weight times vertical drop is the gravitational potential energy Per unit time makes that into a power. So weight is mass times gravity. G is 9.8 meters per second squared on planet Earth. H is the height, this height here. And so the maximum output of the turbine is mass, gravity, H over time. And that's just repeating what we had on the last slide. But the mass flow rate of water is the mass per unit time flowing through the flowing through the pipe. And I'm going to just put a little dot over the M to tell you that's a mass flow rate. So that's how many kilograms per second are flowing through the pipe. So we can replace M over delta T with just M dot. 
So the maximum output of the turbine is the mass flow rate of the of the water through the penstock, kilograms per second. G is 9.81, uh, 9.8 meters per second squared, and H is this height. It's really simple. Now that's the, that's the if you like that's the the potential energy content or potential energy loss of the water. Uh, but not all of that gets converted in, just like all of these stories, that there's an efficiency. The turbine doesn't, doesn't, isn't 100% efficient in converting that to electricity. And so you have to include a turbine efficiency in here, which is the ratio of the turbine power to the, the maximum power, the power that's actually in the water. So the final equation is just that the turbine power is turbine efficiency. That'd be a number, you know, pretty high number, but maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.9. The mass flow rate of water in kilograms per second. G is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8, excuse me, meters per second squared. And H is the elevation head, the height that the water falls through the penstock. So it's a fairly simple sort of plug and play equation. The key is to recognize that what you're uh, calculating here is the rate of loss of gravitational potential energy of the water. That's m dot gh. And then you've got an efficiency that the turbine, there's some turbulence in the turbine and friction. The turbine doesn't convert all of that energy into electricity. So let's just use that equation just as a, it's a pretty plug and play thing. So imagine you have a, a turbine. And actually, this is about, I was at a, a a mountaineering hut in uh, British Columbia, and they have uh, a, a little turbine like this. They've dammed up the water coming off the glacier, and they have a head of about 15 meters to the hut. Uh, water flow rate, typically around uh, 30 kilograms per second, and they have a little turbine. And the beauty is you're you're way away from civilization, and you have uh, electricity for hot water, to dry your gloves and all those sort of things. So it's it's uh, pretty neat. So this is kind of based on that turbine that I saw up in uh, in the mountains in BC at the mountaineering hut. Uh, let's say we have a flow rate of 30 kilograms a second of water. So that's 30 liters a second, just to give you an idea. A kilogram of water is a, a liter. The head available is 15 meters here. And let's say the efficiency of the turbine is 75%. That's fairly reasonable. There would be some friction and turbulence, and not all of it gets converted. So it's a pretty straightforward calculation. Uh, straightforward calculation. It's just efficiency, mass flow rate, GH. You're told that the mass flow rate is 30 kilograms per second. That's M dot. And so it's 75% efficient, 30 kilograms per second, 9.8 meters per second squared is the acceleration due to gravity. And then H is uh, the, the amount that the flow drops, which is 15 meters. And it works out to be about 3.3 uh, kilowatts. So 3,307 uh, kilowatts, uh, which is about what I would estimate. You know, that's enough to heat water. So amazingly, uh, you're, you know, several hours of hike with a full pack away from civilization and you have a lovely hut with uh, with lights and uh, electricity, and uh, you know it's wonderful. Uh, amazingly, you can't turn this off, so the, the heaters run all day. So uh, they they basically just dump the extra power to heaters, so you can you can dry your boots and your gloves. Uh, so uh, that would be a small a small wind turbine, of course, uh, a, a hydraulic turbine. Of course, commercial turbines would be in the megawatts. Of course, hydropower is not without its downside. There are some significant environmental impacts. Uh, I mentioned flooding land uh, because of water impoundments and redirecting rivers. And when you do that, uh, the flooded land, you know, it has trees and vegetation, which eventually rots. And there's been some studies that show that the carbon dioxide and methane emitted when that vegetation rots can be significant. So, so you might be surprised to hear that hydropower actually uh, in the uh, construction stage and the flooding stage of the of the uh, reservoir, there are greenhouse gas emissions. 
there's also significant impact on people. I mentioned the James Bay Cree, the First Nations in in, in uh, Quebec and uh, Canada, but also in uh, China. That when the Three Gorges Dam in China was completed, which is the the large, I think it's still the world's largest hydropower dam at 22.5 megawatts. That's like 22 huge coal-fired plants. That's amazing. You know, that's enormous. But when they built this, they flooded a huge amount of land and uh, uh, the valley of, I believe it's the Yangtze River. Yeah, the Yangtze River. And uh, people had to move, uh, you know, higher up in the valley and they displaced a large number of people. So it's not without its social impacts. Uh, there's also concerns on wildlife that you have reduced flow in the river and siltation behind the dam, which affects, you know, not just fish, but all aquatic species. Uh, in BC, there are concerns that, you know, uh, salmon, they, they spawn in the river, they swim down river into the ocean and spend their life. And then they swim back upstream to uh, spawn and end their life cycle. And when you put a dam in the river, <coughs> Excuse me. When you put a dam in the river, that uh, uh, you know interferes with their life cycle. Now they've tried putting fish ladders, sort of little ladders that where the fish can jump and go around, but they've not entirely been successful at that. So there are some environmental impacts, especially on uh, fish populations. And hydropower is not without risk. You know, people think don't think about this, but dam failures are not uncommon. And this can have some fairly catastrophic effects on uh, people. And I think I've got a few slides next that show that. Here's one from, of course, I've been teaching this course a few years. So this is from uh, Feb 2017 in Northern California, where the Oroville Dam failed and, uh, you know, 190,000 people evacuated. So quite substantial uh, dam failure in Northern California. It's not uncommon if you keep your eyes peeled, you'll see dam failures around the world all the time. That Oroville dam failure, uh, following that, the New York Times did a special showing that America's aging dams are in need of repair. And they, they've got dots here of all the uh, dams that are considered in need of repair in 2015. Uh, yeah, dam is considered high hazard based on the potential for a loss of life. Uh, as a result of a failure. And there's about 2,000 high hazard dams <coughs> in the United States. Here's another one uh, in Laos, uh, in Asia, in July 2018, where a dam failed and uh, resulting in uh, lots of property damage and hundreds of people missing, uh, killing several people and displacing 6,600 others. Uh, this happened, I grabbed this last year in May 2019. Uh, you know, dam failures are becoming a regular occurrence in the United States because of lack of maintenance. And this is some pretty interesting footage. Watch, see if I can uh, change my pointer here. Okay, so here we go. I got it. So here, watch this. this is, you wouldn't want to be downstream of this dam. And you can imagine the increase in the flow rate in the uh, river that pretty much happened instantaneously. So hydropower is not without its dangers and environmental impacts, not surprisingly. Okay, that completes chapter 12, which was on electricity from solar, wind, and hydropower. And of course, this is the end of, of part three on hydropower. I suggest you have a look at uh, uh, the chapter 12, those pages, 374 to 409. And also there's a, a problem set where you can practice some of those calculations and review some of the concepts. And that completes uh, part three.